my name is Jeffrey Griffin. This is Wednesday, November 14th, and I'm in the Utah Valley University George Sutherland Archives in Orm, Utah, interviewing Kathleen Larson for the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk. Today we're going to be talking about Kathleen's life and her contributions to life in the state of Utah, and also the young, young single adult work here in Utah County. So, My very first question for you, Kathleen, is give us a little bit of background information about where you come from. Mostly, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Schools you went to? Parents? Stuff like that. I was born in Santa Monica, California. Uh, I grew up in a home my whole life that my father had built um, in Mar Vista, California. And I went to high school at Venice High School, which was the high school where Greece was filmed. And it would be Greece. And, uh, it was just a couple miles inland from Venice Beach, and you know it was a it, it was a wonderful place to be and a great time to grow up there. Um, my parents were are <laughs> George Ida Miller and Lenora Brooksby Ida Miller, and um, and um, I they built a wonderful home for us and. We loved going to the beach as friends and family, and it was a great community. What did your parents do for work? You know, my father worked for Douglas Aircraft for many years after he came back from the war, and then he went into business on his own um, in a, a paper uh, processing plant as far as um, processing it for, man for packing and, and uh, shipping and things like that. You said came back from the war. Want to tell him? Does he have any good war stories? Or yeah, he was involved in twenty-seven major landing invasions and missing in action twice in the South Pacific, and he has a lot of good war stories. I tried to record those. You know, like the time they drove all the way through an enemy-occupied island with their. He was an amphibious uh, tractor uh, captain, and. And when those things are out of the water, they make a lot of racket. And I think there were two or three of them, and they were, they'd landed on the beach, and they were driving through the island. And um, he said they noticed the enemy in the trenches along the side of the road. And he thought, well, we're not stopping here. So full throttle ahead, they flipped on all their lights, and they pushed ahead as fast as they could. And they could see the enemy just kind of throwing up their hands and jumping out of the, and heading for the jungle, <laughs> he said. <laughs> yeah, I think they thought a whole landing invasion was coming, and they drove and drove and drove until they didn't see the enemy for a while, and they drove a little further, and then they decided to set up camp. And, and the next morning, he said, I could have thrown a stone and hit the waves on the ocean that they had driven clean through the island. And he got on the radio, and he said, I don't know why you guys are landing over there. That's where the enemy is. There's nobody over here. And if you want us, you're going to have to come over and get us because we're not <laughs> going back the way we came. <laughs> but he has, you know, several great stories of driving several miles of a beach um, and spending the night and coming back the same way and seeing people going with landmine detectors and digging landmines out where they're imprints of their tracks in the sand had gone right over the holes where, where the landmines were. And uh, they hadn't said any of us. And I said, well, that's because my sister and I were up in heaven and he needed to be our dad. So we were looking out for him. <laughs> How many siblings do you have? I have one sister. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a neat, it's an interesting story about um, how my mom and dad met and, and how they got us children. Um, she was this little country gal from Fr Fredonia, Arizona, and he was this big city guy from Los Angeles. And uh, he was the last customer at the at a gas station for the night that her brother owned, and she was down with a girlfriend visiting. And um, they invited him over for watermelon and got to know each other. Um, when when uh, they fell in love, and he went to her grandparents, her parents, to ask for her hand in marriage. Um, side note here: my my, he wasn't a member of the church, 
my f grandfather, her father was uh, the justice of the peace and the bishop in the little town. And he said to him, not until you have a house to put her in. And he left town. Mother thought she'd never see him again. Grandpa thought he dealt with the situation. And he went down and bought that home in Mar Vista. I bought the land, a bean field, built the home, uh, put some furniture in it, showed up back in town and said, I have the home to put her in. And Grandpa turned to Grandma and said, what do we do now? And Grandma said, I don't know, you made the deal. <laughs> and uh, so they were married two days after my mother turned 17. And that was the home that I grew up in. And um, they hadn't been married too long when the war came along and he received a letter that his friends and neighbors had chosen him to serve them in the war. And so my mom stayed there in LA by herself and he went into major action. And uh, while he was serving in the Pacific, my mother wanted to get her patriarchal blessing. And so she went back to her little town of Freejoin, Arizona, where her uncle was the patriarch. And her father said, sweetheart, that's not how it works. You need to go to the patriarch of where you're living and, and get your blessing from him. And she said, but he doesn't know me from anybody. And he said, well, that's the way it's supposed to work. So she went back and she went to this patriarch. And in the blessing, she was told that her children would be born under the covenant. Well, they hadn't been able to have any children. And he wasn't a member of the church. And she was worried that that meant he would be killed in the war. Somehow she'd marry a member of the church and somehow they'd be able to have children. Instead, more miracul miraculously, uh, he came home alive, joined the church. They prepared and went to the temple. And from the time they went to the temple, she found she was expecting me. I have one sister, Pamela Joyce, that is born two days, I mean, two years and four days after me. And that's all the children they could have. But that was children born under the covenant. So it was a great promise and a, you know, just kind of a neat family thing that that Heavenly Father knew the plan and promised her blessings. And they came. And it's interesting how that story has affected my life. As I was growing up and as I was a teenager, um, it really affected the decisions that I made because my mother had said to me that she wanted a baby so long, so badly, and uh, that her arms would ache when she would see other women with, with children. And they were married 12 years before I was born. and because I knew how bad they wanted me and how much they loved me. I could never bring myself to do anything that would break their hearts. And I know my mother said, I don't know why, you know, it took so long for us to have children and how come it was so hard. She had several miscarriages and, and it was just that she ended up having to be bedridden for the last few months to get my sister and I here. <laughs> and she said, um, you know, I don't know why that process had to be so difficult. Thank you. And, uh, and I said, you know, well, mom, I, I can tell you a blessing that came from that. It, it was the effect it had on my life in knowing how much she loved me and cared about me. And, and it, it guided my choices and my decisions. Well, and I'm, it sounds like you spent quite a bit of time in that house where you grew up in, and I'm sure you have a very long list of family stories and anecdotes and all that. Well, you know, my father, he, he moved 19 times before he graduated from high school. And I think he was really glad to just, this is our home, we're staying here. <laughs> you know? And I was blessed from being able to just, you know, grow up in that home. And, that's great because it leads us into very intuitively into our next question. The first one, and interchangeably maybe, is what what's a traditional family food 
that you remember growing up or that you have in your house right now and maybe some other very important memories from your childhood if you can think of anything growing up in the house mm -hmm. food there are two of them okay one is family fudge night mm -hmm. and uh, I can remember my mom would do this she'd get a heavy steel pan and she'd make a batch of homemade peanut butter fudge and the way we would eat it when it was done was just pass out the spoons and everybody would dive into this warm creamy fudge and just eat away and we thought that that had started in her home and it wasn't till recently that I was reading the letters that my dad and mom had written back and forth during the war and in it it said that um, my dad missed the fudge nights in her family's home. So I realized it had gone back a generation after that. In our home, we do that. And I, my grandkids will say, Grandma's at fudge night, <laughs> you know, and so we'll have 20 of them, you know, we'll strip the babies down to their diaper and set them on the table and hand them a spoon. And as soon as that fudge is done, it goes on there. And you kind of know if you're in, in the family, if you're handed a spoon, and if you're willing to just dive in with the rest, then you're in, you're a part of the family. And it's been interesting as, uh, my kids of you know spouses have joined the family that when they feel like they're really comfortably in the family they're in the middle of that fudge pot with everybody else the other one is apple homemade apple pie and my mother just made the most delicious apple pies she even won awards for them and everybody loved my mother's apple pies and i've taken her recipe and i've adapted it because down in LA you didn't do a lot of bottling of fruit, but I've adapted it to use my homemade bottled apples. And I make apple pies now and everybody loves them. And um, my eldest son, Roger, when he was courting the, the Annalisa, the gal he married, he baked her an apple pie. I think he won her over with that apple pie. So that apple pie has history to it in our family. And, uh, and she wanted the recipe and he said, mm. It's a family secret. You can't get it unless you join the family. <laughs> so I guess it was worth it to her to get it. But anyway, we joke about that. But, you know, so fudge, fudge night and apple pies. Yeah, those are our great traditions. And do you have any outstanding, particularly acute childhood memories from growing up? Or? Not a lot. I just remember, it's kind of interesting, your perspective as you get older. I can remember you know, the accomplishment of putting on the roller skates as a little kid, you know, with a little key that you turn to fit it around your shoes. And when I could skate all the way down to the end of the block and back, or, or the bicycle, you know, when I finally, the training wheels were off and I could ride all the way down to the end of the block and back. Well, I've gone back and visited that home. And, you know, it really wasn't that far to the end of the block. But to me, as a child, it was quite a ways and quite an accomplishment. And who were some, some women that you admired growing up? I would imagine... It was my mother. Was mother. I think if I had to... She set an amazing example to me. She was a wonderful woman, and I learned a lot from watching her serve others, serve in the primary and the early society, and, and love others, and... I wanted to be like her. She's a great mom, too. What do you think made her a great mom? Just how much she loved us, and we knew it. Whether she was um, praising us or disciplining us, we knew it came with love. And is there one experience from your early life or from all of those memories that you think helped prepare you for what you would call your life's work or what you're doing in the most important days you have right now? Oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, if we brought the music part up, it was um, a woman that had a great influence to me was my elementary music teacher. Mm -hmm. She was Mrs. Qualino. And um, she talked me into playing the cello in the elementary school orchestra and singing in the chorus. And, and, and when I was a sixth grader, she even let me lead the sixth grade chorus. And I can remember thinking, when I grow up, I want to be, I want to do what she does. I want to be like Mrs. Quadlino. And so I think that that really kind of 
directed later when I decided to go to college and major in elementary music education that you know, I wanted to do what she did and do for others what she did for me and instilling that love of music. And, and as far as music goes, I know my father, he had a great voice and I was a voice specialty at BYU, but um, when we'd finish dinner, he'd, we'd sing together. He'd sing with me while we did the dishes. It was kind of a family tradition that we'd, that we'd just sing together and I loved singing with my father. Do you think there's one particular person or do you have one particular person in your life, childhood or otherwise, that you felt was a mentor to you uh, to help you kind of have that particular influence in your I life? I don't think there's one particular person. I think it's been a, a whole bunch of different people who have had impact and, and influenced me and set an example for me along the way. And you've already kind of answered a little bit, but where do you think your love for music came from? First off, and then I'll. I think it came with me from heaven. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I just think it was innate. But then, the people I've mentioned around me, you know, it encouraged. I can remember they called me to be the ward choir director when I was sixteen. They wanted me to lead the. At that time, they had singing. The release I had what was called the singing mothers chorus, and they wanted me to lead it. But there were only two problems. I wasn't a mother and. I had to go to high school. I mean, I was in school in high school when they wanted to practice, but um, I it was just people who who kind of, in a sense, mentored me and said, "We want you to do this. You can do this," and kind of encouraged me and helped me and gave me the tools to be able to to do those things. And I found out I loved it. And is that something you've tried to pass on to your children as well? Yes, I. You know, I. And even my parents, it's interesting when we drive across country or have a long road trip, uh, my husband and I, and even the kids, we'll turn it, we have XM radio, and we turn it to the 40s station. And we know all the songs from the 40s. And and we were thinking, how? Wh why is that? You know, I wasn't born until 52. And it was because we heard it in, in our homes. And I heard my dad singing those songs, and I knew those songs. And, and so we just sing along to the radio, and I love the songs of the 40 because they're songs of hope and, and beautiful love songs. I, I don't know if I look at the music today, and I don't see a lot of beautiful love songs anymore. And I don't know if that's a kind of a characteristic of the times or whatever, but in the 40s, you know, that was a neat thing, and I loved that kind of music. And um, so my parents gave me, you know, surrounded me with beautiful music, and that's what I tried to do with my children. And to give them appreciation of all different kinds of music, but appreciation of, of good music, you know, even though there was the variety. And so um, hopefully I can credit a little bit of their love for music that they got from me and my husband. And, and I know when I married Dennis, he brought in his, he had all the beautiful love songs. I mean, he's a romantic. I, I could just tell by looking through his sheet music repertoire after we were married that, you know, he had all these songs from the musicals, Rodgers and Hammerstein, all these beautiful love songs. And uh, I think, um, I think as our children developed an interest in music and a love for music, um, for my husband and I, it was important for us to encourage them in that and support them in that. My, my two daughters play the flute, my son plays the trumpet. We were you know, heavily involved in Tim View High School and the marching band program that they were in as band parents and, and, and their wonderful teacher, mentor, Mr. Fulmer, and who not only taught music but taught life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so all along the way, you know, helping them and encouraging them. And, and now it's neat to see, and gathering together and singing, it's neat to see that that's going into their homes. In fact, my daughter Christy brings her three boys to my house so I can teach them to play the piano. And, uh, and her one, my one grandson, Tyler, he loves 
loves it. He loves it, and I just it thrills me to see that that you know he's developing a love for that. And they're one of them's playing the baritone, and the other one's playing the trombone, and the other one wants to play the French horn. And I'm going, yes. <laughs> now, was it something your children took to you naturally, like a duck to water, or did you have to kind of saturate them or beat them over the head with it? And well? you know what's interesting, because <laughs> now I'm teaching my children, my grandchildren, piano. I can remember hating practicing as a little kid and my mother saying, you need to go in there and practice, you know, <laughs> you need to do this and I don't want to and, you know, trying to think of a million things you could do to fill that 30 minutes on the piano bench rather than really good practice. And I see the same thing and my children were the same way and my grandchildren are the same way. I persevere because now I am so grateful that she kept me going. Or I wouldn't have a lot of the wonderful things in my life that had to deal with music if she hadn't said, you know, it'll be worth it, you know. And I can say that to, I said that to my children and I can say that to my grandchildren as well. That, that you know, if you are willing to put in the effort, this will bless your life. And you will be able to bless others' lives. What kinds of wonderful things do you have in your life because of, because of how you grew up in this very musical environment? I, I think my, my, I have to divide my memorable musical experiences into two categories. Mm -hmm. um, one would be um, the memorable ones, and, and those would be, um, I've got to find that here so I don't forget. Um, I love leading choirs. And choruses and um, for many for 20 years plus I was the primary chorister and I I would say that's the best job in the whole church and um, whole generation of children you know it, it, it started that I was teaching the children of the children and uh, just love that experience leading those primary programs which are always the best sacramenting programs of, uh, of the year and and then um, Teaching, I taught music at Canyon Crest for a few years and loved that opportunity. Um, I was heavily involved in PTA and in the schools of Provo School District and um, being able to serve them. And we had a great big celebration of PTA and children. And we put on a program of combined choruses of children from all the schools in the elementary schools in the district in the Provo Tabernacle. And it was a wonderful experience to, to share that with, with the children. Um, I love um, being in choirs. And, and I think that's kind of how I learned to direct, by just being there and learned to sing and picked up the skills just, you know, being in the word choir or the school choir or whatever it was and, and learning along the way. Um, I was involved in a, a group of singers, which was basically from our stake, but also uh, you know, served the community as well. It's called the Ruth Burr Singers, and we would do Oscar-winning songs and musicals, songs from musicals, and and Christmas songs, and and classical and and religious, and performing in that group, and then getting to co-direct that group and and lead them in. Those were fun times. Those are those are great times. Um, I think that the other area would be the spiritual side of music. And I can remember as a young girl, probably teenager, I was asked to sing a solo in sacrament meeting. And I chose to sing, I Walk Today Where Jesus Walked. And as I sang, the Spirit was so strong that um, it was a strength, a testimony building experience. It, it, was, it was such a spiritual experience to be able to sing. And I think that's why I love being the primary chorister is because you you teach the gospel through music. Oh my goodness, when you combine music and the gospel, 
there's nothing better. <laughs> and um, and so that, in, in when I've sung and felt the Spirit strongly as I've sung, been an instrument in our Heavenly Father's hands, I can remember um, when I was the primary president and a mother in our ward accidentally backed over her child and was killed. And our primary was asked to sing at the funeral. And as the children were rehearsing, I just looked at this choir loft full of these children. And it was almost like there was an aura of light around them. And I had cause to stop and pause and think, who are these children? Why is it so important that they have strong testimony so early in their life? What is going to be their task? What are they going to be called to do in their lives? And why, why do they need this? Why has this spiritual experience been given to them? And it was almost like angels were surrounding them. And, uh, and that was, once again, music and children and, and the spirit. Um, the other time uh, was when I was involved in the church's celebration of the Pioneer Cisco Centennial. And our stake was asked to help in reenacting scenes from pioneer life and crossing the plains. And we had a meeting just prior to, to doing that. And the chapel was full and all the way back through the cultural hall. And I was probably at least halfway back in the cultural hall. And as we would sing the songs, and in particular as we sang um, Come Come Ye Saints, turning around to see who all the people who were who were singing behind me and they they weren't the voices I was hearing did not equate to the few people who were in the rows behind me and and as we sang tears came to my eyes and I and I realized that the angels had joined us that those people that we were honoring those pioneers who had sacrificed so much were singing with us and that experience was so touching and and such a, such a spiritual experience through music of, of singing with the angels or having them sing with us and so music in my life um, the spiritual side has been incredible and in how it's touched Crying again. <laughs> That's okay. Speaking of life-changing events, how did you and Dennis meet? We met at BYU. <laughs> we were in a student ward together. It's interesting. The first year I came up to BYU, um, we were just friends. The second year I came up to BYU, my parents brought us up again, and they attended church with us that first Sunday. And Dennis happened to be conducting Sunday school. And my mother leaned over to me and went, you should go for him. And I said, Mom, that's just Dennis. So it was just Dennis. What was that, September? Um, come December, our family home evening group wanted to go up to Salt Lake and see the lights on Temple Square. But we didn't have enough cars. We needed help getting up there. Well, we all knew Dennis because he lived right here in Provo. He's a Provo boy. He had a car, so they said, ask Dennis if he'll help to get us up to Temple Square. And uh, and so I did. And at first he said, I don't know if I can. And I thought he had a meeting or something. And and then later he said, I worked it out. I, I can do it. And so we rode up to Salt Lake. And when we got up there to Temple Square, for some reason, the rest of the group kind of disappeared. And there was just Dennis and I walking through this beautiful scenery. And he took a hold of my hand. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> what is this? And, uh, and, and when my roommates saw it later, they kept saying, what's going on here? <laughs> I, said, I don't know. Anyway, uh, later he told me that it was like Heavenly Father had hit him over the head with a baseball bat and said, 
wake up. This is the one. Uh, he was getting ready to graduate at the end of that semester and head to pilot training in Texas. And uh, we weren't even serious. Well, a week later, he asked me to marry him. And I thought he was kidding. I almost laughed at him. And then when I looked at him, I thought, oh my goodness, he's serious. We hadn't kissed. We were not serious. And boy, did that put me into a lot of fasting and praying and trying to find out if this was right. And uh, he came down to get me from for Christmas to bring me back up to school. <laughs> and my family teased me that I said I had to tell him yes because it would have been an awful long drive back to Provo if I didn't. But actually, it was so hard that that evening, and I had been fasting and I had been praying, my family had been fasting. In fact, my cousin who was living with us said, I don't know why we're fasting, you're gonna marry him. And it made me mad. I thought, I don't know that, you know, everybody else did. But anyway, um, at nine o'clock he said, well, what's your answer? And I was so scared that I said, I can't tell you till 10. <laughs> so we spent another hour visiting and at 10 o'clock he said, it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> and I was really on the spot. And then this piece hit me. It was like, after the trial of your faith come the blessings. And this peace hit me, and I told him, I would be proud to be his eternal companion. Six weeks later, we were married and off to Texas for pilot training. And uh, people ask us when we got serious, and Dennis and I look at each other and go, gee, I don't know. Are we serious? I think we're still just trying it out. <laughs> But it's been a wonderful life together. And we love each other deeply. How do you think such a, a quick courtship affected your marriage, even just in the earlier? I don't know. I think I got all of the trial and anguish over with just those couple of weeks trying to figure out if he was the right one. Uh, because it was like from the moment I, we said yes, I said yes. There was peace and things just went so smoothly and worked out so well. I know when we told my parents and we chose the date, Dennis said, oh, you know, six weeks isn't very long to plan a wedding. Oh, don't worry about it. You know, if you had six months, you'd probably do most of the work in the last six weeks anyway. <laughs> we laugh about that still. But, you know, the first... I don't think there was a cross word the first year or two of our marriage. Not a disagreement or anything. And and Dennis and I just attribute that to Heavenly Father knew him and he knew me better than we knew ourselves and especially each other. And when you have the Lord as a matchmaker, it, it works out pretty good. <laughs> When did you first begin working with, you mentioned that you studied elementary education or uh, teaching elementary uh, music yeah, and uh -huh. working with, with young children. When did you start working with young single adults as opposed to, to children? Oh, let's see. Uh, they called me to be um, young women's camp, girls camp leader. And I did a lot of music there and worked with the young women there. Um, once again, working with the high school kids in connection with um, the music program at Tempview. Um, when my husband was called to be bishop on campus. Um, it was a wonderful experience. First he was counselor for a few years and then he was bishop for five years. And, um, and it was the perfect timing because by then our children, we had three children attending BYU, so they were in the ward. And, uh, and I had the best calling in in the ward because I was they'd call me Sister Bishop not Sister Larson but Sister Bishop and um, whereas my husband worked with them and you know if there were problems they'd go to my husband I just got to love them that what a great job to just love these kids and um, be the mom away from home and uh, give them a hug and encourage them and 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 so we have some 
kids that were in the ward that just are kind of a annex to our family in ways and and we and and we still keep in touch with them and uh, it was then, you know, as you think about the future of the country um, and the world, that we realized it was gonna be okay because these kids were sharp and they were good. And um, BYU professors that taught the gospel doctrine lessons in our home ward, these didn't do any better job than these kids in the student ward who relied on the spirit and taught from their hearts. and. Uh, Knowing that, you know, we were going to turn over things and, and the world was going to be in their hands was okay because we, we knew who they were. We saw their hearts and, uh, and so blessed from having that experience. And now we're serving in another uh, young adult stake and, and ward. I'm the stake music chairman, my husband's award clerk, getting to know these people and, and uh, be friends with them and, and, and love them. It's, it's just a wonderful opportunity. Are there any specific memories or examples or spiritual experiences from being a bishop's wife in a young single adult world? Ward or, or working with a stake that, that come to mind when you think of that period of your life? The whole the whole experience was incredible. I because our kids were in the ward, you know, I, um, and we lived so close to BYU, there would be times when one of our boys would call up and say, Can we have a few friends over to watch a movie? And we'd say, Sure, we'll be home in about half an hour, and we'd walk in and you know, like a quarter of the ward would be there sitting in our, and, and we'd have impromptu barbecues and picnics and karaoke nights. It, uh, if you want to really get to know somebody, put them in front of a karaoke machine with a microphone and uh, you see the true side of some of these kids. And, uh, and we've got some good blackmail material as well, but, uh, but still, um, just the whole thing, in fact, um, our oldest three children found spouses in that BYU ward, and we referred to them as our bishop, bishop blessings. So while well, Dennis was bishop, uh huh. While well, he was bishop, yeah. Um, actually, our our daughter um, met her husband in the ward, and and my husband said it was a really unique opportunity to be the bishop and the father, and uh, I can re I can remember um. Jim passed a note to my husband and it said, and he brought it home and he showed it to me, it said, I, I need to talk to you, not as my bishop, but as Christie's father. And we went, uh-oh. <laughs> and so they were trying to figure out a way because Jim and Christie were inseparable and how they could do that. So Dennis came up with the idea that, hey, why don't we do your, um, what's it called? Every year you have to get at BYU, uh, you have to meet with the bishop and have a ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical endorsement. endorsement. And so he said, let's, let's do your ecclesiastical endorsement. And Chrissy went, Dad, it's only February. We don't need that until April. And Jim's going, sure, we can do that. We can do that. So Chrissy was kind of, you know, why is he pushing this and why is Jim so gung-ho? So they went ahead and did it, and you know, Christie's was short, and Jim's was a little bit longer. My husband told me later, and uh, and I said, okay. So when you told him yes, when he asked for our daughter's hand, did you make him promise to love and cherish her always, and provide for her, and be a good husband and father? And he said, no. I just told him that after this was over, to explain to her you know, to get me out of trouble with her and explain why we went ahead and had the ecclesiastical endorsements. I said, you gave her away for that. And <laughs> but, uh, but so that was choice. He said, I, I knew the kids our kids were dating better than they knew the kids our kids were dating. And then our two sons, after he had been released, they stayed in the ward. They told him they could stay in the ward. And shortly after that, you know, they met their sweethearts. 
when which years were you? Oh both, shoot, I can't you know, remember. Or... Oh, I can't remember. It has to have been ten years ago. So our kids, let's see. Our kids are in their mid thirties now and they were in college then, so maybe even longer than that. Time flies. Yeah. Well, speaking of your children and your family, what is one thing that you feel helps bind your family together, if it's a hobby or a pastime or a tradition? You know, I think it's the time we spend together. But in particular it comes to my mind, we love to go camping together. And we would pack up this well-worn, it was bought used and half falling apart. First we went in tents and then we bought this tent trailer. And, and we'd spend two, our two weeks summer vacation, just hook up the tent trailer and try to make various loops that would cover as many state parks and national parks as we could. And we'd just spend that time together out in nature. And, um, and I think it brought us close. And I and I didn't I didn't realize then um, the impact it was making on our children. But now when they think back to good family family times and great family memories, they'll refer to the camping trips we took, and it and they still like to go camping with us now, Grandma and Grandpa, and they like to go camping with their families, and. Um, I know we had people in the ward who would go on cruises with their families or fly to Europe or whatever. And, and one of them came up to us later and said, you know, I wish we'd have done what your family did. Just go off together and go camping. It, and it, I think there's something about being away from all the things of the world that pull, you know, you need to be to this appointment and you gotta get that done and the phone's ringing and, you know, and just being, together with not the world not pulling at you and just being a family and creating memories together. Speaking of outside influences and things pulling you every which direction, and what, what do you do in your life to relieve stress when you have situations like that? I have to laugh because I have, okay, I'm going to share this with you. When I was a teenager and things can get really crazy with demands of time and school and everything else if I had a particularly frustrating or stressful moment I would go home and I would go into the coat closet and I would close the door and I would let out a blood curdling scream as loud and as long and as hard as I could scream and then I take several deep breaths and then I open the door and exit the closet with a smile and my family would like, okay. <laughs> but for me, it worked. It was just like, ah, and then, okay, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> and so still at times, I think I, I, I'll i take some deep breaths and go. I like to talk about it a lot. Um, and my husband is probably the one that gets to hear about it the most. But he's a good listener. And then after I've talked it through, then I can go, Okay, <laughs> and just press on and think all about all the good things. I, I think when life gets discouraging, I've noticed that this to me, and I'm thinking things are going better for other people than they are for me. It's a, I realize it's a matter of perspective, that I'm too busy with my head in this position, looking at, at all everyone else and all the things that seem to be going so well for them when if I just crank that head down, humble myself a little bit, and count my many, many blessings, and realize how wonderful my life is, it kind of puts everything in perspective. And what has been perhaps the most significant trial in your life up until this point? Watching my mother in the last years of her life as she struggled with severe health problems. Um, the last 11 years of her life, um, she was in a lot of pain, bedridden a lot of the time, in a wheelchair. We, uh, and I was grateful to be close enough just around the block from my parents 
that I could help my father care for her. Um, and there were times in the middle of the night that the phone would ring and I would just hear my dad say, help. And I wouldn't even grab my coat or bathrobe in my nightgown. I'd jump into the car and go around the corner. And I would pause a minute and think, okay, Heavenly Father, I don't know what the situation is and I don't know what I'm gonna find, but guide me, give me the strength to do the right things and say the right words and, and be the help that's needed. And um, my mother was the source of my testimony. I mean, I lit my candle, my light from her and as she struggled and suffered, she would question sometimes. This was toward, she was 11 years. She died at 73 years of age, which was way too young as far as my father and I were concerned. Um, but it would be hard for me to see her faith waver and to see her struggle and uh, and I can remember her saying, why am I still here? Why do I have to stay here and suffer? I'm, I'm of no use to anyone. Now see, I think people come two ways and, and two lessons we need to learn are um, to serve and to be served. And my mother was one of those people that came knowing how to serve. And her job, her trial was to learn to be served and that was a difficult thing for her because she said I'd much rather be serving than having to have other people help me and uh, and she say I I just I don't know why I'm here I'm of no use to anyone and I said to her one day well I sure hope you're not here because we still need to learn something because I know the kind of person you are and I know you would have said I'm willing to do that if it will bless the lives of my family. And I can remember one day, and this was just a few days before she passed away, and we didn't know it was going to be a few days before she passed away, but, but I said to her, Mom, do you know that your Heavenly Father and your Savior love you and that they are aware of you and what you're going through and that they're there for you. And my mother was quiet for a little while and she said, well, I used to know. And I stopped. And I said, Mom, if you ever needed to know, you need to know now. You don't want to get on the other side and have to apologize and say, oh, oops, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot for a moment. And she was quiet again and she said, I do know. It's just very hard. And so I can remember being in the hospital with her when she took her last breath. And I could have ran out in the hall and had them come in and rush in and resuscitate her. But I was privy to the peace she was feeling. And even though I had to call my father over and convince her that she was gone and not just sleeping. And then watch him through the next 10 years grieve her loss and miss her terribly. I was grateful for the opportunity to recall that peace and know that yes, I had let her go even the days when I missed her terribly and I wanted my mom back and know that it was okay. And then taking care of my father for those 10 years and, and holding his hand after he passed away. and feeling the joy that he was experiencing and being reunited with my mother and not, not the sorrow 
anymore. Um, those feelings and those experiences letting me um, let me learn. And I realized that maybe my mother was there so that I could learn more compassion, that I could learn greater empathy and understanding for people when they're suffering. I know it made me a better Relief Society president. It made me a better friend. And when I held their hands and hugged them, I understood more what they were going through. And uh, I thank my mother for being willing to teach me through those hard experiences and those trials. Did you have any maxims or mantras or memorized scriptures or anything super close to your heart that helped you get through situations like that or, or this stuff you've carried with you through your life? I have a motto of life. Mm -hmm. um, my motto is you can either laugh about it or cry about it. You might as well laugh. And I just kind of try to live by that. My dad was a funny guy. He would tell jokes. He would give the high priest attendance report in rhyme and bring into that the result of the recent BYU game. He would pull candy out of my children's ears and everybody loved my dad dearly. He was a character and he was a fun guy. And I think that ability to laugh and think of the brighter side of things um, when times get tough. Yeah, I got from my dad. <laughs> Looking at where you are right now and how things started out in your little house, in, or from your parents' little house in California, how, how do you think your life is different today than how you imagined it when you were 25 or 26 or going to school? It couldn't have turned out better or more wonderful. I mean, I think it's everything I could have hoped for. Yes, there have been the ups and downs, the joys and the sorrows, the twists and turns along the way, but, um, but it's been a wonderful experience and a wonderful life. Um, I've learned a lot, and it's been a choice experience. It, I've truly been blessed. Is there anything that's markedly different in your life right now that you never would have imagined happening when you were, when you were younger? Something you never planned on or never expected? Or... There have been things along the way that have, you know, been, oh my goodness, now how do we deal with this? You know, those kind of things where you just say, okay, Heavenly Father, what do we do now? You know, the door just got closed, you know, help us find the window, <laughs> you know, sort of things in our lives. Um, but, but it's been okay. You know, I, I think my greatest I know my greatest joy right now. I mean, interesting, my husband and I were talking and we're in an interesting point of life right now because we can see both ends of it. You know, we, we can, we know where we've been. Um, just, just yesterday I was talking to my daughter, Christy, and she was getting in the car again to go pick up kids from school. And, you know, the other day she had to make two trips back to school for forgotten homework and whatever and, and uh, she says I'm getting back in the car again mom um, I do that a lot and I said Christy do you remember that keychain I had for so many years and on it it said if a mother's place is in the home why am I always in the car and uh, when we got rid of uh, finally our Chevy custom van died 
and we had to get a new vehicle. Uh, my dear friend said, you got rid of the van? You raised your family in that car. And I thought for a minute, my goodness, she's right. <laughs> You know, we did. We raised our family in the car. And and to see my daughter in this busy time of life with, you know, four children from 13 to three and all that that involves and getting them where they need to be and feeding them and clothing them and, and all of that. And, and I just, I saw her. I said, I'm looking at you, Christy, and I'm seeing through my mother's eyes exactly what she saw when she looked at me when I was where you are now <laughs> and it's an interesting perspective and and it's it's neat to be where we are right now um, to glean from the past and, and 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 be able to see the world how our parents saw it and through their eyes and and to look at our children and our grandchildren and and know what's ahead for them and in you know, not in all aspects or specifics, but, you know, and see where they're headed and what, they, what, what they're going through. And then to see where we're headed when we reflect back, when I reflect back on the last years of my parents' lives and the last par years of my husband's parents' lives. We were really blessed to have both of them living in Provo. So my children grew up with both sets of grandparents right close and the extended family relationships and associations and at what a blessing it is to have that support group and um and i i love having right now knock on wood i don't know how long we'll have it but right now all of my children are married and all of them live close and all of my grandchildren are close and we're together all the time and to see the relationships I mean to see how children grandchildren are interchangeable between parents and uncles and aunts and to see how much the cousins love each other I have uh, one of my children gave me this tile with the wording on it that says grandma's house where grandchildren, where cousins go to be, become best friends or whatever. And um, it is so true. And another child that says, some of my choicest blessings call me grandma. Those relationships with those grandchildren and those children and their spouses, um, my husband and I have said, are the greatest source of our joy at this time in life. Family. What would you like to be remembered for, either by your family or by those of us in your ward, those of us who you've served throughout your life? Just someone who loved and served them and the Lord. I help the people I come in contact with. That I am a source of lifting them up and letting them know that they're cared about and that they're loved. Um, and as you know, this, this interview and this project is for the Utah Women's Walk, um, celebrating women and the impact they've had on the state of Utah. You working with children and, and young single adults. Um, what I guess you'd say advice or counsels would you give to younger women in the state of Utah, um, either from experiences that you've had that maybe you wish you hadn't had or experience you have had that you treasure, what would you tell the younger generation of women in this state? I'd say hold to your high standards. Trust the Lord. Go forth with faith. Do your best and serve others. And if you do those things, no matter what happens, you will find happiness you will be. I, I think one of my greatest, that thing that brings me the greatest feeling of accomplishment is being able to serve other people, you know, 
not having it be about you, but having it be about the people around you and, and being an instrument in helping them feel better about themselves and helping them know somebody cares about them. How do you feel you've had an impact on your community? Um, first off, your community that you live in. It was wonderful being involved in my kids' schools, being involved in the PTA, um, because we could actively do things that had a direct result in improving their education and then their growing up experiences, um, improving the schools that they were involved in. Um, I liked, I loved getting to know their teachers and their administrators. You know, um, being involved in their what they were involved in in their lives at that time. Um, improving situations for all children um, and all people. And realizing as I worked on the whole city, Provo City School District level and, and seeing the varying needs in different schools and different socioeconomic situations and, and realizing what was important to all children and all people and trying to improve those situations and make things better better for them. And for years you and Dennis have both worked with young single adult wards and stakes, hundreds if not thousands of college age students and, and what kind of impact do you think you've had on that community? You know, I don't know. Because <laughs> um, you lose contact with with the majority of them, some you stay close to always, and uh, it almost seems like you know you cast your bread upon the waters and it comes back to you threefold that that our relationships with them are choice and it blesses our lives because of us having known them um, and just being able to brush shoulders with them. But hopefully we've. been able to instill some hope in them and um, a knowledge of their worth and and um, value their contributions. Is there anything additional that you would like to have recorded about your life? Anything, anything that came into your head? Anything you want to share with us? Any extra questions you'd like me to ask you? Hmm. You know, I think back to, you know, and kind of reviewing the whole life, I think back to my mother and my father and that beginning. My mother, there used to be a laughing joke around the table that Fredonia, how, do you know how small Fredonia is? Fredonia, Arizona. It's just over the Arizona border from Utah, from Kanab, Utah. Fredonia is so small that you can write, that they write, come again on the back of the welcome sign. My dad would always love to tell my mother that. And uh, her graduating class of 11 from high school, she being the only girl. And my graduating class of Ennis High School of 1100 for just the summer graduating class. They had two, a winter class and a summer class that had to be held on the football field to accommodate it. Um, going from that little town to the big city and then ending up in Provo. I love it here in Utah Valley. I love being so close to the mountains and nature and the beauties. Um, but who would have ever guessed that I came up to BYU and met a Provo boy and would be so lucky to be able to stay here and uh, raise my family here. And uh, comparing the differences between growing up in a big city and raising my and out in the mission field and raising my children here and and realizing that where I grew up things were more black and white you know and as a high school student um, in a sense it was almost um, 
like they knew you were a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and they knew what you believed in and they expected you to either live it or say I don't believe it um, and so the it was almost a positive pressure to do what's right and set a good example up here raising my children in Utah Valley it's more of a gray area um, that they um, they see supposedly good kids making not so good choices at times and uh, and all maybe almost even harder to be good you know because it's so easy to just slide a little bit you know it's not like a big leap over to the other side and yet um, the amazing blessings of being raised in a community of so many good people and so many good kids and family that support your values and your morals and and so um, my kids have actually come to me and said thank you for raising us here thank you for the opportunities that we had and the things we learned and 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 teaching us. I know I I took one of my sons aside particularly and said you know you are a strong spirit and it's time for you to choose whose side you're going to be on. Both sides would love to have you on their team because you are going to make a difference no matter what decision you make but you need to choose choose wisely and realize the implications of that choice luckily he chose to be on the good side <laughs> and all of my children have um, you know they've had their struggles and their trials and uh, but they've all it's it's so wonderful to see them making righteous choices in their lives and raising their children um, and in the gospel and seeing their children choosing to be good and do what's right. Um, yeah, it makes it all worth it and, and, it, and it's good, it's a good life. You mentioned backtracking just a tiny bit, serving a mission or being a missionary or in what capacity did you serve and how do you think that affected you and your family? Well, you know, I got married just before, a little bit before I turned 21, so I didn't get to go on a mission. Um, but as a young girl growing up in L.A. with many non-member friends, um, we had opportunities to share what we believed and set an example of how we lived with them. And I can remember my sister and I had this friend, uh, Frances Hanyon, and her family situation was not good. But she started going to primary with us and she's, you know, and the missionaries taught her and, and her parents let her be baptized and join the church. And then the family moved away and we lost all contact with her. And um, it wasn't until just a few years ago, I got this letter from her. And um, and she called and she said, we're up in Provo and we're dropping our son off at the MTC. And I said, really, friends? She said, we'd love to stop by and see you. And for her to say, yeah, our, my family moved and things weren't good and I didn't go to church for a while and da da da, but I knew it was true and I remembered the experiences I'd had, and I met my husband, who was a member of the church. God acted in the church again, and raised my family, and, and now her children are going on missions. I would have never anticipated that. And so I wonder how many of my friends um, I was able to influence that I'll never know. Um, one young man um, that dated my sister for quite a while, and and joined the church. Uh, he's just like a brother in our family now. They both ended up marrying different people, but um, so I had those opportunities when, when I was young, 
um, to do missionary work. And, um, and then my husband's mission. He had to wait to go on his mission because at the time um, Vietnam War was happening and they, the government put a quota on the church that they could only let so many missionaries go because the non-members were saying, our sons have to go fight in wars and your sons get to go serve missions. And so he had to wait till he was almost 21 to go on his mission. And um, he served in the Southern, served in the Southern Far East mission. And um, after we were married, and, and, and he ended up serving in Taiwan, Singapore, and Australia on his one mission. And after we were married, I realized that one of the most meaningful two years of my husband's life was that mission he'd served. And I said, I wish I knew more about your mission. And he went and he got his missionary journal that he'd kept. And he said, here, read this. And I read that journal. And after that, I felt like I had served that mission with him. And I realized that a lot of um, the experiences we've had and the relationships that he kept with the people that he knew on his mission and that he um, taught and, and um, our families relationships with them and them being in our homes and us visiting them and and sitting in our family room and having them say to my husband in front of our children we consider you a brother in our family your picture hangs on our wall with our family photos. We hate to think where our lives would have turned up, how our, how our lives would have been if you hadn't knocked on the door and brought the gospel into our lives. And um, I can remember our son when he was trying to decide if he, our oldest son, if, if he wanted to serve a mission or not saying to his dad, I've decided I want to go because I see the difference your mission made in your life and in the lives of the people you served. And I want that same thing in my life. And so um, my husband and I are looking forward to the time when we can serve a mission together. But it seems like that those experiences through my early life and through vicariously with my husband and his mission and our sons and their missions um, and looking forward to being able to serve as a couple you know missionary work has been a part of our lives and blessed our lives the whole way, the whole way along well that's the end of the questions that I've prepared you're more than welcome to keep adding if there's something else that popped into your head. If not, we're going to talk to... Yeah, let me ask a couple. Of, what would you like to do in the future? What do you see yourself doing in the future? How will you continue to contribute? Just, um, hopefully I can keep doing what I'm doing. I can keep serving people, um, whether it's in the church or in the community, uh, being a good mom to my kids and and helping them as they raise their children and being a part of their lives and 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 making a difference in the lives of my grandchildren. How many grandchildren do you have now? I have 14. I have five children. Dennis and I were blessed with five children. Um, Go through and tell us their names. Our oldest son, Roger, and then Richard. Richard and Roger were born 17 months apart. And then I thought, oh, that's close. It's time for a break. And then I just didn't feel good about it. So 18 months later, I had my third uh, child under three. I had three under three, and uh, boy or girl, Christy was born. And then I felt like it was uh, time for a little bit of a break. And I can remember the women in my ward thinking, they'd come up to me and they'd say, because we were the younger ones in the wards, in the, in our ward. In fact, we'd moved from a newlywed, nearly dead ward, where they'd save the back two rows for nursing mothers and everything, into this ward where 
I felt like I needed to sit on the back row and suck my thumb because everybody else, I mean, the lessons were preparing your son for a mission. And I think, boy, I missed something in the middle. But these wise women would come up to me and say, enjoy them while they're young because they grow up so fast. And I can remember running through my mind thinking, who are they kidding? I know I'm going to be diapering for the rest of my life. (laughs) And their words come back to haunt me. Uh, After three and a half years, we had another son, Mark, and then a daughter, Carolee. And this last week, my baby turned 30. Um, And they were right. They were so wise. And their words, enjoy them while they're young because they grow up so fast. rang so true. I can remember my parents came, moved up here because my sister and I were both up here and raising our families and so my dad sold the business and, and they moved up to be by us and uh, they lived with us while they built their house just on a street up and um, I can remember one day my mother saying to me and it was because I was so busy trying to serve and do everything and and be the perfect everything to everybody that when I sat down to hold my kids, I'd feel guilty because the list of how many more things I needed to do would run through my mind. And one day my mother sat me down and said, Kathleen, stop it. Stop it. Now is your time to hold your babies. There will be other times in your life to do these other things. Don't miss out on this. And actually, because of my mother's wise counsel, I really enjoyed my last two babies a lot more because I thought, okay, mom said it's okay. It's okay to stop and enjoy this time in my life in this moment. And uh, and so hopefully I'm passing that on to my daughters when life gets crazy as a mom uh, that, you know, enjoy the moment because they grow up so fast and I can't believe that my oldest grandson is 13 getting ready to turn 14 and my youngest daughter is 30 life goes quickly is your father still alive no he passed away 10 years after my mother and uh, we all miss them (laughs) a lot in our lives all of our parents I, I, had a, I had a wonderful opportunity, and maybe I should share this. Um, Dennis and I were the oldest in our families. Um, well, he had one older sister, but um, to get married and, and have children. So our children are the oldest cousins you know, down. And um, when I married into that family, first we were in Texas for a while. And when we came back from Texas, I think it's been the second Memorial Day or something, we were finally here in town. And I can remember being with his, fam- his family and saying, well, what should we do for Memorial Day? And someone said, well, we should go put, you know, traditionally like we do, go put flowers on mom's grave. And I said, well, who's mom? And, and Dennis said, my mom. And I said, that's your mom and found out for the first time that that wasn't his birth mother, that his mother had died of breast cancer when his sister was five and he was three, Mm -hmm. and he hardly remembered her. And yet, just before she died, she took her wedding ring off and handed it to his father and said, you go find a good woman to be your wife and mother and raise my children. And, um, and that family is incredible. There is no, there are no in-laws. There are no steps. Everybody is family. And so my father-in-law, my father, would call me his daughter. And toward the end of his life, when um, he was in the hospital, he had a, massive heart attack Um, actually started having the heart attack sitting in general priesthood meeting next to my husband his son and and our son and my my husband took him to the hospital and uh, 
they did surgery, but the heart was compromised and he spent three months that summer in the hospital. Um, and because I was in the situation where I was close and I didn't have any little children at home, it was my opportunity and blessing to spend every day with him in the hospital. And uh, just a couple weeks after that happened, mom, Dennis's mom, fell and um, broke her wrist and her ribs and a few, th and she ended up in the hospital. And for a while I had one on one floor and one on the other. And, but the, the choice moments I spent with him, serving him, brought us even closer. And he would introduce me to the nurses as his daughter. And then my husband would show up and he'd say, and this is my son. And the nurses would figure out we're married. And they're trying to figure out who was the real son and who was the real daughter. Um, um, and he sharing his life experiences. And I can remember one day he said to me, I guess I think his lungs would keep filling up with fluids and I would hold his hand as they would push that big needle through his back and drain the fluid off of his lungs. And he was sitting there and, and he said, you know, I wonder how the people feel who in the early years of their lives make the conscious decision not to be bothered with having children. That it would cramp their life style or you know they'd have to make sacrifices or whatever he says I wonder how they feel when they reach the end of their life and they're sitting in a hospital bed and there's nobody there to hold their hand there's nobody to care about them if they think back on that decision they made and question the reasons for that decision and he said I am so grateful for family I am so grateful for you. And uh, when my daughter was trying to decide if she should, at this same time, why I'm spending all this time in the hospital with Mom and Dad Larson, my daughter is falling in love behind my back. And when she told me about it, I said, this is not good timing. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that right now. <laughs> I was too involved with the end of life and and uh, but she went to her grandfather and asked him for some grandfatherly advice on if there were two guys and which one should she marry and uh, you know fasting and praying about it and she wanted some advice from her grandfather and uh, and 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 so we told him that Carolee, you know, wanted to know what he thought. And, and, and he thought about it a while. And the next day, um, he took my hand and he'd kind of been sleeping and he opened his eyes and he said, about Carolee, you need to tell her that she needs to make the decision and then take it to the Lord and he'll let her know, you know, if it's the right decision, but it is her decision. So we told her that she's going through all this and we had got him out of the hospital and he fell and broke his hip and ended up in the hospital. And the doctor said, we doubt he will make it through the surgery but we can't let him just lay here and suffer with this broken hip because he will just die a slow death. And so we think we need to go ahead and operate. And so we kind of thought that the chances of him surviving the surgery in the morning was not high. And so everybody came to say, I love you. And those three months allowed us all the opportunity, to, his children that lived out of state, to come and spend time and visit with him and the whole family to gather around his hospital bed and have him give us words of 
counsel and his word to the whole fam his words of counsel to the whole family were find out what the Lord wants you to do and do it. And I had a dear friend that after he passed away embroidered that and we've got it framed on the wall. But um when he when my daughter embraced him, he said, Carolee. And, and and David, her husband, had come to the hospital with her. Her husband to be had accompanied her to the hospital. He said, You've got a good man there. Don't let go of him. And uh, she took it as her grandpa telling her that this was the right guy. And when he hugged me, he said, Thank you, dear daughter. Good care of me in all these months. We all went home and we got on our knees and we actually said, Heavenly Father, if he is not going to make it through the surgery, please don't make him go through the surgery. I had just stood up, the phone rang. It was the nurse saying, You better get down here quick. And when he got there, he had passed away. And uh, here we go again. The lessons learned, the relationships, the, the love, all of that is what made that experience. And the closeness of families. And because we had both sets of parents in town, Dennis's extended family on his side and my extended family on did things together and, and knew each other and loved each other. And so it is just... You know, those relationships, I, they let us know what's really important in life. Um, and Heavenly Father lets us know that because it's the relationships we take with us. So true. Not, not the material things, not other things, not worldly things. And it's the relationships. It's how we love and serve each other that are the most important in life. Well, that's a good, that's a good statement to end on, isn't it? Good job. Well, thank you so much for your sharing your life and your philosophies about different things. You've obviously been a thank you. great servant. Well, great and, and blessed, well. blessed by it. Blessed by the service.